it is my distinct pleasure to inform you that our first speaker in this session is Professor Oz Gülseren from Bilkent University. He is also a senior researcher at Tubitak Research Institute for Fundamental Sciences. Professor Oz Gülseren is going to talk about magnetic properties and critical assessment of Hubbard U parameter for two dimensional materials. Makes sense as an example. Also, Jam, please come. Thank you. Thank you, Ali Kramojam. Okay, now you have my full screen and I hope everybody clearly uh, hear me. So uh, let me start this uh, new phase of the quantum frontiers uh, advanced to cool. This is the second stage. Uh, in the uh, previous three days, we talked about the, some basics. Uh, we heard a lot of uh, interesting thoughts and so on. Now we are ready for the second part. So it is my privilege uh, to start uh, with this lecture uh, today's uh, advanced tool on uh, quantum frontiers. Uh, in this uh, lecture, uh, what I choose to talk is the magnetic properties uh, for this uh, quite uh, famous active materials of the recent years on uh, two-dimensional uh, materials. This is quite important. Uh, you will see, I'll try to motivate through the talk, uh, but uh, this is quite important since uh, the spin properties and uh, on top of that, the magnetic properties are quite important for uh, uh, quantum technology applications as well. We do uh, have the entangled uh, states of the spins. We do have the uh, storage applications, sensing applications, and so on. Uh, so it is worth to uh, address uh, this part. And I'll uh, mostly working on two-dimensional materials. These materials are interesting uh, by themselves. So I'll combine these two uh, interesting problem and I'll try to uh, give my two cents uh, on this topic. And you will see that the magnetism is uh, quite important, but it has difficulties to uh, describe this, and especially on these uh, two-dimensional materials. This is a new field. Uh, several papers are publishing on this area. But still, we are learning. It is uh, establishing. Uh, it is quite active in that sense. Uh, so, uh, okay. Without further ado, let me start uh, since time is also precious. Uh, on this talk, uh, I'll follow uh, these three sections. First, I'll introduce a very uh, quick introduction about the 2D materials. Then I'll uh, show some examples uh, of uh, magnetic 2D materials. Then uh, in the uh, uh, second part, uh, I'll talk about the, how we can handle these interactions on the strongly correlated systems as well uh, with the localized orbitals and so on. That's quite critical also for uh, quantum uh, uh, technology applications. Uh, okay. Uh, let me start uh, with the graphene. So the story of the uh, 2D world uh, actually starts with the graphene uh, by the first uh, mechanical explanation uh, performed, uh, carried by the uh, Professor Gaim and the Novesalo, and actually they end up with the 2010 uh, Nobel Prize. Actually, it's a very well known material since uh, we are all familiar with, uh, for example, the pencils, the black stuff uh, 
inside the pencils or the uh, ordinary coal we used to burn in the ordinary ovens in the old times, we have the graphite. Graphite is a, a three-dimensional material, but it's based on the layers. So the layers are stacked on top of each other and the interaction between layers uh, is quite weak. It's a one there was type of the interaction. So if you take a single layer of this uh, graphite, you end up with a uh, single layer of the carbon atoms, which is called as the graphene. Uh, the structure is very simple. It's a hexagonal lattice, okay? The carbon atoms are just sit on the corner of this hexagon and they make covalent bond with the three neighboring carbon atoms, sp2 type of the bonds. Uh, and that's it. Even though it has a simple uh, structure, it has very excellent ordinary material properties and exotic physical properties. Okay, it's uh, in terms of material, it is very light, it's very strong, transparent, good conductor, and so on. So, uh, it is flexible. Uh, uh, so, uh, because of uh, its exotic properties, I'll mention a couple of them. Actually, it leads the, uh, for example, very weak uh, European consortium. That's the one first uh, flagship program, the graphene flagship program. It's one of the largest funded uh, European uh, project. It uh, combines forms of consortium between all European uh, researchers and so on, just with the graphene. Then this is extended to the other to the uh, materials. So why it is so exotic? Uh, it is because of the uh, this simple property. So here I'm just showing the uh, uh, pi band of the graphene. So we have a two-dimensional materials. We have the pz orbitals parallel to each other. So they are uh, interacting. This pi interaction leads a band, uh, energy band that I'm just showing here. This is the full uh, uh, kxky in three dimension or its projection along the high symmetric points here. So if you look at here uh, at the k point so this is sorry it is a little bit distorted but it's a perfect uh, hexagon the corners are k and k prime points uh, here these two bands the valence band and the conduction band are just touching each other so that's the, uh, where the fermi points fermi level lies as well uh, so that's the all uh, physical properties uh, the transport the uh, optical excitations and so on, you name it, uh, we observe around the Fermi level, okay? So if you look at closely around there, so even though, I mean, this is simple, uh, you can easily calculate this tight binding expression. It's in form of uh, a nonlinear expression square root of some form of the cosine function and so on. But if you look just around the Fermi level, uh, here I'm just schematically showing this enlarged region. So this red part is the valence band. This is the conduction band. It is just touching at the single point, and uh, there's a linear distortion just in the vicinity of the final level. Okay. So this is the so-called famous drug cone, and uh, that's why uh, uh, the graphene becomes so uh, popular and so exotic uh, as well. Uh, since, uh, okay, let me try to emphasize here, uh, but this drug cone, that's actually here, this band structure there. So in the ordinary, uh, usual Schrodinger fermions, we have a dispersion of the band structure uh, and so on. But here, at the, around the Fermi level, we have this linear dispersion. And this is effectively the form of the Hamiltonian in Anchoja showed, uh, for example, on yesterday's lecture, the simultaneum, uh, it's very same form as the ultra relativistic drag particles. So that's the reason, uh, even though we have a, a, a not the 
relativistic particles here, these are just the fermions, uh, electrons uh, we are talking about. They effectively look like uh, uh, this uh, uh, ultra relativistic drag particles, this fancy structure. But it's effectively they are equivalent. So this system on graphene is called as the mass distract fermions. But if you uh, go away or if you uh, uh, assign a mass, then uh, we have a dispersion there. You see the linear dispersion uh, returns to the harmonic. Uh, and so, on. so be, because of this, actually, these electrons has the, uh, 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 has very large Fermi velocity approaching ten to the six meter per second, and uh, uh, we have uh, high mobilities uh, for device application. Uh, there is also like the effect anomalous uh, quantum Hall effect, uh, like Klein tunneling, all exotic uh, phenomena. Uh, quantum phenomena absorbed uh, on this system. Uh, then very recently, actually, to uh, uh, 2018, uh, about three years ago, actually, uh, so when you look at the bilayer of the graphene system, if there is a, a small rotation between these two layers with respect to each other, it's like a one degree, then you end up with the, uh, this so-called more patterns uh, that opens a new field on this one, since this leads to the uh, superconductivity on this magic angle rotation and uh, very exotic uh, electron structure as well. So just because of this, uh, uh, very rich fundamental physics, physical properties, and so on, that led to the Nobel Prize, uh, the Gaiman Novesalo, who first uh, exfoliated uh, this single layer at 2004. Uh, just this is the quotation for the Nobel Prize for grant breaking experiments regarding the two dimensional material graphene. So that's the uh, starting point of the story. But later on, uh, that's just the beginning of the story. Later on, first, the other uh, group for elements like the silicon, germanium, tin, uh, tried first theoretically, then experimentally, then uh, borrowed nitrite as well, uh, just the uh, two elements next to the carbon for the two dimensional form. Uh, after these pioneering studies, then the every uh, different combination uh, from the uh, periodic table are tried. Like the transition metal decalcogenite, so these are the transition metal atoms, then they uh, uh, buffered uh, from top and down with the calcogenite atom, like the sulfur, selenium, tellurium. Uh, that's uh, another uh, very extensively studied system of the two-dimensional materials. Uh, the list goes on, on. Then, in the recent years, the vaccines are the rising ones uh, along uh, on this uh, family. Here, maybe I can show this uh, uh, number of the studies, number of the publications throughout the years. You see the graphing goes uh, on top. Okay. Uh, then, here the green is the hexagonal boron nitrate. Its structure is. Uh, uh, Iso to the graphene is an iso structure of the graphene, but it's an insulator. Uh, it's uh, has a uh, not uh, that uh, ex uh, do not have that exotic properties that the graphene uh, has, uh, but it is used as the buffer material and so on, or it can be functionalized and uh, so on. Uh, so here, what I show uh, these uh, stars. This is the maxim you see it's uh, rising exponentially. So it becomes very popular for many different uh, applications. So on this, uh, we studied the magnetic properties. So today I will not uh, present entirely on them, but I'll try to uh, shed a light on the magnetic, uh, 2D magnetism on these uh, magnetic properties. So in order to do uh, this, Either you can uh, study this uh, experimentally, 
But as I said, people are trying to get the new materials, design new materials with these exotic properties. Uh, actually, we need a method that has a predictive power. Uh, that's, uh, that's the functional theory. I mentioned on my first lecture in the previous school, it has the predictive power. Uh, then uh, we can use uh, the techniques, methods based on uh, DFP uh, and uh, predictive system for uh, its properties. And so, so I will not uh, spend time here since I want to say a lot of things, but what I conclude that just using, uh, I mean, either if there is an empirically, uh, the uh, experimentally you can try, and if you synthesize, uh, it might be difficult uh, most of the time. If you get uh, some uh, novel structure, then you can go and do the, this accurate PFT calculations and try to uh, describe its properties, or either uh, you can use the FT calculations, predict some systems, then uh, check its uh, stability uh, and so on. Then if it is uh, promising, if, if it has promising properties, then experimentally people can try to synthesize this guy. So this is one example. These are the uh, uh, transition metal uh, cal calcogenized, uh, just a single calcogenized, a planar structure, uh, a lot of them um, from periodic table were studied, and I'm just showing the uh, DFT based phonon calculations. You see, if it is uh, like this, strontium selenide, there is no negative phonon mode, so this is dynamically stable. Uh, and that means actually uh, you can go to the lab and try to synthesize this material. While uh, some material like the barium oxide, there's a, this negative mode, so this uh, indication of the uh, unstability and so on. So here on this study, we look at the maxines. Uh, the maxines, uh, let me quickly describe. Uh, so this is actually uh, the max, if you just uh, this part, the max is a bulk material, three dimension bulk material. It has been around maybe 30 years. It's uh, well known uh, by, uh, you can get from the chemi uh, chemistry stores uh, and so on. Uh, it has a, this simple structure. M, M just stands for the, this early transition methods there, okay? Then this A stands for the group A elements. That's denoted uh, with the green color here. Uh, then the X is either carbon uh, or uh, nitrogen atom. Then if you look at the structure, we have this early transition metal atoms, okay? Then in between, they are sandwiching the uh, X, carbon or nitrogen. Then in between uh, these layers, these green atoms are uh, this, uh, some uh, group A element there. So actually this uh, text structure from the uh, three-dimensional thing, but it is very easy to chemically etch this group A elements between them. So when you etch this, then you end up this two-dimensional material that's called the maxine. Okay, then they have uh, really uh, extraordinary properties. Uh, we study these for battery application uh, and uh, so on. But now uh, uh, we concentrate on uh, magnetic uh, properties. Okay, so now uh, maybe in uh, five minutes, let me introduce the examples of the two-dimensional uh, magnetism. Okay, uh, this is quite important. So. Uh, because uh, first of all, uh, I mean, uh, we have some exotic properties coming from the, this uh, anisotropic two-dimensional structure. Then we are able to manipulate this uh, spin that will lead uh, uh, I mean, the spintronics around uh, for several years. Now we are talking about the nanomagnetism. 
and uh, using these combining these properties uh, the uh, storage sensor application energy application uh, several applications are developing uh, during uh, all these uh, these uh, years so here still uh, there is a huge challenge uh, regarding this since uh, the first for example uh, the stability we should check the ambient stability of these uh, structures okay uh, in order to make uh, practical uh, applications and so on then once uh, when you find uh, some uh, property novel property then we have to show the scalability of these guys when you go to the uh, device structures uh, you have to check their interactions and so on in terms of the magnetism uh, actually the crude temperatures are important so uh, the system uh, are showing the uh, uh, magnetic state uh, at for example room temperature uh, or a reasonable uh, operating temperatures uh, and so on uh, yes uh, actually uh, we are uh, having some progress both from the experimental and the theoretical uh, point of view here i'm just showing some lists so these are some materials uh, ferromagnetic materials antiferromagnetic uh, materials uh, studied in the literature uh, to the uh, magnetic materials uh, and the list is growing uh, every uh, every uh, day. Uh, still, uh, this is uh, some examples from the literature about the uh, uh, application and also engineering tailoring to these magnetic properties. How we can uh, uh, enhance the magnetic moments or the uh, temperature the transition temperature and so on uh, we have a lot of uh, tools uh, to play with uh, so first of all we can make a heterostructure of these guys so we can form a uh, two layers uh, with two different uh, uh, two, two different mag uh, two dimensional materials uh, like for example, I show here the graphene. Then there is a transition uh, metal, the calcogenides there, uh, and so on, so on. So you have the stack of different uh, materials. Then you combine uh, different properties on one uh, uh, composite system. Then, if you wish, you can intercalate in between. Then this additional intercalation atoms brings the charge, for example, to the system. Or for monolayer, single layers. We might have the defects uh, like the vacancy here or the doping. These are all tools or the citray. Uh, these are all the tools that we can uh, tailor uh, these uh, properties. Yeah. So I'm just showing you see uh, several papers. Uh, these are like the Nature uh, 2017, Nature 2017. Uh, Nature technology. This is another nature paper. Uh, this is nature reviews from the physics, nature physics. These are all recent papers, impact papers, uh, just discussing the uh, magnetism uh, on uh, these uh, two D uh, materials. So here, some more examples and so on. Then let me show this uh, since this is quite pioneering study and uh, very uh, 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 important examples of the 2D magnetic materials. This is chrome trihalide. Uh, so as you see uh, the here, the purple color is the chrome atom, then the, there are three iodine, iodine structure. Uh, then manipulating to this uh, spin orientation uh, that it is possible to go uh, both uh, ferromag uh, ferromagnetic state as well as the uh, uh, 
alpha ferromagnetic state. Uh, well, here uh, it shows as a function of the temperature, it shows the uh, magnetic moment of, over the chrome, and uh, you clearly see the uh, phase transition around uh, 100 Kelvin uh, on this structure. So this is an experimental data uh, from uh, this paper. You see it's already uh, received uh, like a 500 citation uh, and so on. And, uh, and this is uh, uh, another example uh, from uh, this paper. This is vanadium uh, decalcogenized. Here, the X, X2 is sulfur, selenium, and tellurium on this structure. So, uh, what we have vanadium here. Then these uh, yellow atoms, either sulfur, selenium, or thallium. Then in recent years, we have the young structures as well. Then again, uh, for example, just to get this uh, experimental data, both of uh, the structures shows the uh, uh, transition now at much higher temperature. So here uh, with the uh, vanadium uh, disulfide, Actually, transition temperatures around the room temperature, while the other two has a transition temperature a little bit higher. Uh, okay, so here I hope I motivate you. This is a new field, open field, uh, with a promising uh, development. Uh, so uh, we have to. Uh, describe uh, the magnetism on this 2D uh, system in a proper way. So, uh, okay, now I'll go uh, and look at the Hubbard model and the DFT plus here. So this is quite important for this 2D magnetic materials, but actually this, uh, this can be uh, for any system, bulk systems as well, not specific to the uh, to the uh, system, but what is important, you will see that we need this Hubbard view, and we have to include this with the DFT calculation in order to uh, describe uh, uh, these uh, properties, especially uh, with the strongly correlated systems, the system that uh, involves the V orbitals, F orbitals, and on the examples I showed, uh, the, the orbitals is uh, already there, like the chromium, three halides, and so on, or transition matter, the calcogenides. We do have the, uh, these the orbitals, then that has to be described correctly. Uh, why uh, we need this? Actually, uh, again, on my first lecture, Özgür Hoca asked a question about the description of the, this uh, strongly correlated system, how good is the DFT describing this and so on, then uh, I said, to answer uh, to that question, I said, we have some methods on top of that, that will introduce, that will correct this self-interaction errors. Since within the DFT, uh, we introduce the non-interacting uh, electron system, then we write down the effective Hamiltonian and uh, we end up with the quantum equation. Uh, so, in that approach, uh, we are losing to the self interaction, uh, even though effective Hamiltonian describes the electron electron interaction. Uh, so, we need the, this uh, correction. So, there is uh, one expansive way, like the GW calculations, but here uh, I'm uh, showing a much cheaper approach uh, for uh, that. So very quickly, uh, uh, okay, uh, so uh, I showed this. Uh, so this is the minimum of the uh, Hamiltonian standard thing. Then we describe everything in terms of the, this charge density, then that's why we end up with the density function in here. But as I said, these localized orbitals, like the B orbitals, F electro, F orbitals, uh, uh, might have appreciable uh, self-interaction errors that we need to uh, fix. Uh, 
Uh, I will show uh, why we, we need this. Uh, uh, okay, so this just, uh, these equations are simply summarize the density functional uh, uh, approach in the with the density functional approach. Uh, the energy that's written here, described, written in terms of this function of the density and uh, then uh, leading uh, uh, consham equations. So when you write down this uh, effective harmonic, it solves self consistently uh, and so on. So here uh, we have one term exchange correlation, the others. This is the clump term, this is the clump interaction, this is the interaction with the uh, it's called the external interaction. That's the interaction of the electrons with these ions within your structure uh, and so on. Then we have to include this exchange correlation uh, term. There are several approaches like LDA, GGA, uh, and so on. Uh, so uh, these are uh, doing quite good job, but uh, there are some uh, uh, difficulties, for example, both LDA and GGA uh, uh, do not get the correct value of the bandwidth. I will show the uh, example in the next uh, slide. Uh, one is underestimate, the other is overestimate the band gap uh, and so on. Uh, you might have, for example, incorrect description of the magnetic order and magnetic moments uh, and so on, if we have these the electrons, F electrons, uh, and so on. In, uh, so here, for example, let's look at these two structures. The first one is the nickel oxide, okay? In the, uh, and the second is the iron oxide, okay? So in both cases, iron and nickel has the uh, uh, d orbitals, uh, since these are three d uh, transition metals. Okay. Uh, then uh, here I'm just showing the uh, band structure calculated by the uh, GGA for both uh, cases. Uh, okay. Let me just try to show what we have. Uh, so this is orbital projector. Just uh, look at this blue dash chart. Okay. So this is the uh, phase coming from the nickel d orbitals. That's here. Okay. Then uh, this red curve. So this is majority spin. The red curve again from due to the nickel d orbitals. That's from the uh, minority CP, uh, okay? So if I just show these states uh, in terms of the uh, atomic notation, uh, we have the, this majority space that's below the Fermi level, then uh, there is a, uh, these minority spins appears here above the uh, Fermi level. And here, this band cap is uh, uh, underestimated. And it is oxygen uh, piece states that appears here. Actually, they have to shift it uh, further away. Now, more dramatically, let's look at this iron oxide case. Okay, again, we have this uh, dash line iron uh, d orbitals majority spin red curve is the iron d uh, orbitals minority spin, and this black line is the Fermi line. Okay. According to this, this is metallic, okay? So this uh, Fermi level is just placed over the, this minority spin state. But uh, actually, uh, there should be a gap on this system. So this is uh, incorrect in that sense. Since uh, we are not correctly describing to this theoretical switch. That has to be corrected. Uh, this is a clear example, just showing uh, we need to this uh, correction over with this uh, the orbitals. So, uh, uh, there are several approaches to fix that. So beyond go beyond the more complicated uh, exchange correlation functional. So in recent years, 
hybrid function of the so-called HCE calculations uh, introduced that include the exact uh, hard default exchange term, then uh, it combines with the uh, uh, seminal uh, correlation uh, in the dysfunctional term. Uh, then this gives the uh, enlarged uh, band gap uh, in the correct direction, but obviously the, doing this calculation is uh, much more expensive, computationally expensive uh, uh, compared to the uh, simple LDA or GGA calculation. Then uh, talk of the scan functionals, the meta GGA in this one, so the GGA is the gradient corrected and uh, it has the uh, LDA is local density. Then in the GGA, we have the first derivative term uh, of the electron density. Then in this scan functions, we have the second derivative included. Uh, but this also uh, improved and so on. Uh, another approach might be the dynamic in the infield theory. Uh, here in uh, last two years and the Hubble view is around, the idea theory is around for many years, but in the last couple of years, actually uh, uh, a method developed based on the linear response, that's the first part of the perturbation theory, to calculate this uh, along with the uh, DFT uh, approach. So this is going to be uh, quite useful and I will show why uh, it will be. So let me uh, very, uh, uh, in simple terms, let me remember what is the Hubble, the Hubble term uh, and so on. So here I just repeat the Hubble term of Hohenheim uh, for you. So here what we have actually, uh, we have the uh, three terms here. The important term is the, this hopping term, T term. So this is just for the first neighbor. Here uh, we have CC dagger. So uh, simply what it's doing uh, uh, and highlighting one particle on the uh, one side, then create the particle in the next neighboring side with this top, uh, sort of the operator. So it's just hopping to the next nearest neighbor, okay? So actually we are okay with this and we are describing this within the uh, within the uh, EFT Hamiltonian. But uh, the second term here, this is electron-electron interaction, okay? Then this U is the on-site repulsion term. Okay, this is on-site repulsion term. Uh, so that's describing that. Then this is nu is the chemical potential. Then this describes the just the uh, uh, charge uh, state uh, of the. Uh, but this is the density uh, density term. Um, okay. So uh, this, if we manipulate, if we can uh, uh, able to. Uh, uh, deal with the second term, U term, this is, uh, then we can correct this uh, uh, missing self-interaction terms in the uh, uh, conscious amount of uh, usual standard DFT approach. So that's why uh, this is called the Hubble Q, and uh, uh, we can include this uh, on top of the standard uh, DFT uh, energies, and that's why this is called Hubble, uh, DFT plus U. The name is just coming from that. On top of DFT uh, energies, we, we should have, we should correct uh, this uh, Hubble, uh, Hubble term. And it is a very uh, simple, uh, simple uh, form in terms of the, uh, uh, this uh, dance the operator, so this is for side I for spin sigma, spin state sigma, magnetic moment M1 and M2 uh, uh, included uh, by uh, this uh, simple form. 
okay and this is obviously acts on the this localized states localized these states okay if the extended states we don't have this pro uh, problem we are describing this but uh, we are trying to correct this uh, self interaction on uh, these uh, localized states at the D orbitals uh, or the uh, F orbitals. Uh, okay, uh, let me convince you this is really uh, working. So, this is again iron oxide. Just remember, I showed this uh, structure, dense of state. So, this is the dense structure of the same guy. You see, uh, uh, the Fermi level is the green line here, and uh, uh, that appears here. And with the standard GGA calculation, this is predicted, as shown, I showed this before, like a map. If you apply to this correction U term, actually what we are doing, you are just shifting to this uh, U orbitals in the correct place, And uh, it opens the band gap, and it also predicts the uh, antiferromagnetic ground space, which is uh, this an antiferromagnetic system. Simply, you can think actually you are just manipulating these localized orbitals. They go to the correct place. They shift. You can simply think they are shifting to the correct place. Then. Hybridization with the uh, remaining qualities S and P and so on also uh, uh, corrects the uh, uh, band structures uh, and so on. So the approach is correct. Then the question is how uh, we can get the, this U parameter. So it's a parameter in that sense, and we don't know the, its value. Since we are trying to do uh, and also we are claiming we are doing first principle of initial calculations. It should be a parameter free, but unfortunately we don't know the uh, value of the uh, value of the uh, this uh, new parameter. So in the early days, one approach is uh, determine this parameter in a semi amplitude way. So this is one nice example. Uh, we studied this for like a solar cell applications and so on. The metal oxides, titanium dioxide. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, what we can do, so we can introduce the U parameter and we can use the different values. So here I'm on this graph on the left, I'm just showing that, okay. Uh, so if you has the zero value uh, that's here, this is the that band structure. If you do standard TFT calculation and GGA calculation here, that gives 2.08 here, this band gap for this one. It's a, a semiconductor, but the band gap value, instead of experimental value 3.2, you get a much, much lower value here. So, now let's introduce the U parameter. We don't, since we don't know the value, what we did at that time, we set the U values, different values, two, two, three, four, five, and so on, and look at the band structure. We do the self-consistent calculation. So this is the behavior, okay? So 3.2, this is the experimental value. You see here. So if you set the U parameter to seven, here, you get the correct experimental band gap. The band structure do not change if you compare these ones. As you see, the band structures do not change too much, but the bands are shifted because the orbitals are shifting, and you get the correct description, electron structure, uh, correct description of the electron structure. Okay, so this is an empirical approach. So this is uh, Okay, but actually not good enough. In one sense, we are claiming we are doing the self-consistent calculation. So it would be much better if we had the self-consistent determination of uh, these facts. Or ab initio determination instead of this empirical approach trying to fit the experimental data, trying to match that experimental data. 
again, uh, there are some uh, uh, approaches there. Here, uh, what I'll talk, uh, uh, based on constraint density function. So here, you introduce the U and constraint uh, have on the constraint density functional. Then on top, if you combine with the linear response, uh, uh, you can determine the U value. Okay. Then further, if you go away and uh, you apply the perturbation and uh, again use the uh, linear response. Uh, uh, linear response perturbation theory uh, here. This is just the first order, but this is already available within the density functional that we are calculating the phonons and so on. Then actually uh, we might be able to do uh, determination, self-consistent determination directly, uh, uh, fully of initio, directly from uh, this uh, linear response uh, calculation. So uh, this constraint DFT uh, uh, with the uh, linear approach, uh, let me quickly try to describe here, just I mean, the details uh, discussed a lot in the literature. Quickly, what you do, you in introduce one configuration, okay? Then you can do the uh, calculation. So if you do the, this, constraint uh, calculation in couple of points, two, three points, then you can calculate the uh, derivative, first derivative based on these data point. Uh, then you can get the uh, response from there and uh, just uh, getting the derivative uh, of these uh, energies, uh, we can get the uh, new parameter again from uh, couple of uh, constraint DFT calculations. Here in uh, last re recent years, so especially I'm uh, uh, referring to this paper here, uh, okay? This Marzari group published uh, several papers on this. They introduced, uh, uh, they improve this formulation uh, like this. So they introduce uh, a variation uh, approach and uh, perturbing atomic uh, potential uh, this way. So this is the projection operator, uh, okay? So uh, instead of doing this finite uh, and separate couple of uh, calculation at these points. So these terms included within the Hamiltonian, then uh, you look at the change in the occupation matrices, delta n. So this is what I showed uh, just uh, here, this part. This is the occupation matrices, okay? Uh, based on the on-site spin state and the magnetic moments there. So in the standard DFT calculation, you get the occupation of its states, but for the given, uh, you get the self-consistent solution for the ground spin, okay? So here, in order to reach this, actually, you have to uh, change this guy, these occupations. Then if you get the derivative uh, of this energy, then uh, we can get the, uh, this new parameter from this. That's the idea. So here, uh, so this, uh, on this uh, approach, they include this term. So this way, uh, it is possible to change, uh, the, uh, assess different uh, occupation uh, matrices. Then you can calculate the derivative as a finite difference. Then from this uh, finite differences, we can go and get the uh, U parameter uh, for the system. So in this one, uh, obviously, uh, you need the uh, uh, in order to do uh, this calculation. Uh, so on this paper, uh, what they 
combine this with a, a perturbation theory approach. So that's, that's the functional perturbation theory. This was already introduced many years by Baroni uh, and the uh, co-workers uh, for, and that was used a lot for the, for example, the phonon calculations, okay? The phonon calculations uh, are now very common for the moment. So this is a similar extension like that. So just using that, uh, that's the functional perturbation theory. We can include this term. Then uh, this can be done over the small uh, primitive cell instead of going large uh, supercells. But since you are using the small uh, unit cell, then you have to use a large uh, number of the Q points, K points in the reciprocal space. This is quite critical. I will show in the uh, next uh, view graph. But since the, still the system size is small, actually these calculations are much, much faster. Uh, and um, so on. here, uh, uh, this table just summarizes uh, three different systems copper oxide, nickel oxide, and, and another nuclear cobalt oxide structures. And the effect of the uh, 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 okay, this is just comparing. So, this is a super cell. Half of the K points. So this is the uh, U parameters. But if you have a small primitive cell, but now you have need a larger K uh, mesh, then you get the uh, same accuracy on the uh, uh, U parameter for these different systems. Sorry, uh, let me go a little bit faster. Here, for example, on these three systems. I'm just showing the effect of the uh, uh, K-point. So you really do need dense uh, K-point mesh uh, for uh, this approach. That's the functional perturbation theory approach. You see for the small ones, there's a huge uh, jumps and fluctuations even. Then after uh, some point with the dense K-mesh, uh, actually, uh, uh, this uh, converges. This is just showing uh, results directly. Uh, convergence of the uh, this uh, U parameter on uh, these different systems with the different uh, uh, K mesh. So we can think the super cell size and the uh, K point mesh. Okay, saying that, let me just uh, show the procedure also be uh, used in our calculations as well. So this is again from the same paper I just showed with the references. So what you do, uh, you try to do self consistently, iteratively try to determine the, uh, these uh, new parameters. So uh, you start with the initial structure, so that can be the non-magnetic state, okay? That initial structure. Then you perform this PFPT calculation. Uh, but first, you start with this initial structure, then you relax uh, this structure, since geometry is also strongly affecting these guys. You relax and you get the self-consistent ground state of these guys. Here, the V parameter is also included in this figure. This is similar to the U parameter. U parameter is the on-site correction. V site is the inter-site correction. It's the same thing, but this is extended to the uh, uh, inter-site corrections as well. But usually, uh, including U uh, is good enough in most of the cases. Okay, let me continue. Then once you get that, then you have the uh, DFPT calculation and you calculate the U parameter, Hubbard U. Then you have to check this Hubbard U, if it is compatible, consistent with your geometric structure or not. You do the structure optimization again, then uh, you compare to 
U parameter in the starting point and the, uh, at the output point. If they are uh, smaller than a certain tolerance, then you said you reach the self consistent structure and the U parameter you stop. Otherwise, you return back. Then using that new structure with the new U parameter, you repeat the, all this cycle until you reach to this uh, self consistent. Uh, U parameter hover cure, which is consistent uh, with the uh, structure as well. Since with this, actually, this bond lines change a little bit and so on. And uh, our experience, actually, this structural change defined uh, the U parameters uh, quite strong. So here, uh, again, this uh, another example that uh, from same uh, similar literature, but this use uh, with the, this new approach, this calculation. On this one, bismuth mangan, this is a perovskite structure, include bismuth and mangan uh, and the oxygens. So if you have the standard EFT, this blue curve is the D orbitals of the mangan, okay, you get a, a metallic structure. But actually, uh, this, an, uh, 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 this is a semiconductor. There should be a gap here. So when you do and go to the this DFT uh, plus U, uh, there's a, a, a opening of the band gap. Uh, you see this D bands of the mangan. So this is the orbital, localized orbital. Uh, shifting up and uh, sorry, up for the down spin. This band shifts upward energies matched with these uh, bismuth states. And this uh, up spin, the orbitals, these bands move downward in energy for that place. And uh, as a result of the decarbonization as well, there's opening of the uh, band. Sorry, uh, time fly by. Uh, uh, I'll show just a second. Yes. Uh, this is our one of our recent calculations. So we are looking to max scenes uh, for this two dimensional uh, material system, uh, looking uh, for the different applications and so on. So, what we are doing. Uh, we are screening for uh, all the Maxine family for the magnetic space. Uh, so uh, it's a two dimensional structure. As I said, in the between, we have this uh, early transition matter. Then, um, sorry, here we have carbon or nitrogen, the X atom, carbon is nitrogen, then the M atom is a one transition metal atom. Uh, that. Uh, so, most of them are uh, non-magnetic, but here some systems, uh, so here I'm just showing uh, cr chromium uh, carbide and uh, chromium N2 and chromium C2 structures, uh, both ferromagnetic, so this is spin configuration, and there are uh, three different, uh, since uh, we have two different layers, three different uh, spin configuration we might have for this one, so three different antiferromagnetic state. So we calculate all these uh, and so on. So what here, uh, let me very quickly summarize, since I'm out of time, very quickly let me summarize. Uh, here I'm just showing the dance of states, uh, okay. Uh, so this is, the top level is non-magnetic. This is the ferromagnetic case. This is the anti-ferromagnetic case, okay? So what we got after doing uh, this uh, density functional perturbation theory approach and the self-consistent calculation, there are several surprising results, but let me show. So this is the non-magnetic system. In the non-magnetic system, uh, this blue, sorry, this yellow one is the dense of state without Hubble Q. Then this green one 
is the total dense load states with the Hubbard U connection. You see the band is shift, and we look at why they are shifted, and actually, yes, they are coming from the chromium D orbitals. This uh, blue is the without Hubbard U, red is the with Hubbard U. You see this band is just that uh, shift towards these lower energies here. And in this case, the self-consistent value of the Hubble Q is 5.6 electron. Okay, just keep that in mind. Then if you look at the ferromagnetic state, so this have a configuration like this, okay? Then what we have uh, here, the up spins, down spins. Again, um, let me just look at the, uh, the orbitals of the chromium, this blue curve here, just below the Fermi level, the Fermi level is this uh, vertical line, is the without Hubble Q. So when we apply the Hubble Q, that is around 780, it's a different value from that, self consistent we got that, that shift down, okay? Then for the minority spin, this band here, that moves up. And there is the opening of the band here. This is also, sorry, this, this shows a semi metal behavior. So there is a actually tiny one, and the other antiferromagnetic you can say it's a semi metal. Uh, then, uh, if you look at the antiferromagnetic states, uh, I'm just showing lower energy state here, then again, similar story. The uh, without Tabur Q, that blue curve move downwards with the Hubbard correction, but in this case, the Hubbard self-consistent value of the Hubbard Q parameter is 6.04 electron volt. And the minority spin states move upwards and the electronic structure is also different compared to the Islam magnetic uh, state or the uh, ferromagnetic state. So here the message is actually, uh, the magnetic property critically depends on the structure and the correct description of the, these uh, D orbitals, these localized orbitals. And this Hubble tube, it has to be described with the Hubble tube, and that Hubble tube has to be calculated self consistently. As you see, you end up with the uh, different uh, uh, parameters. So the empirical fitting or some uh, gas is not good enough. Maybe I should. Uh, appear uh, without taking so much of your time. Thank you for your attention. So there are some questions. Also, James, thank you very much for this very nice, comprehensive and exciting talk. Now, of course, we, we can pass to questions. Please ask questions or send a message through the chat button. In chat, Indeed, we have several questions. Also, Jam, can you comment them? Yes, I'm just going them. Uh, so there are a couple of them. So let's go. Uh, in the F. Hamiltonian, uh, I can ask the F. Hamiltonian. Uh, we did not include electron electron repulsion to our Hamiltonian. What is the physical reason for the Hubble to add another repulsion part? So as I said, I'll show. A couple of examples, uh, like the iron oxide. Since you don't have this uh, self interaction uh, in the BF uh, Hamiltonian, that's the missing term. And when you have a system like uh, this localized orbitals, actually this interaction becomes important. So somehow we have to correct this. And one is the way of this, just including this Hubble view correction. And uh, I showed to that band structure. Very quick, I'll try to go there. This is one extreme example. That's why I'm just uh, trying to show. So, for example, this iron oxide case. Okay. Uh, so, because of that missing interaction, this D orbitals that's here without U. And this is the minority spin. Then you end up with the metallic state. So, with including this, uh, uh, U just on this case, just this localized D states here on this system, you see these ones are shifted down there. 
and uh, these shifted up and uh, a little bit changed with the hybridization as well. And we have the uh, uh, band gap correctly described there. So we do need this uh, on these systems like the uh, D systems, F systems, and so on. So in recent years, these systems become popular. Now we are looking at uh, many different materials with the F, F orbitals as well. Uh, so actually, this is quite essential. We need to go and uh, do this. Uh, or uh, then uh, you might need to go some more complicated functionals, or maybe even better to go like a GW uh, type of uh, calculation. Then I did ask another question. Uh, Okay, about the uh, K point. Okay, so in the Marzari's paper, uh, he studied the bulk system. So for example, this iron oxide, this is not the Marzari's paper, uh, but uh, some related group. So this is a bulk, bulk system. In the bulk, you have the three dimensional cases. So obviously you have a, a K meshes in along the all three directions. In the, our calculation, we have a two-dimensional one. Uh, I didn't show uh, uh, the convergence test of our case, but in our cases, the, uh, we use the mesh uh, uh, values 12 by 12 by one, since we don't need along the perpendicular direction for the two mechanics. But these are symmetric in all three dimensions because of the uh, bulk system and that, uh, uh, paper they introduced the method. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sheida asked also uh, this Hubbard view, but I think when I talk uh, answer to I then I gave uh, some answer to that. So uh, in order to describe, uh, this is the Hubbard funny. So you see this U turn, this second term in the Hubble Tomotoni. So we are not writing this exactly to the uh, uh, EFT Hubble Tony, but this is the original Hubble Tomotoni. The second term is the uh, electron electron uh, interaction. And this is on site, on site. You see, look at the indices J and J, and this is on site uh, electron interaction. Uh, with these uh, things, uh, using this idea, uh, so we are trying to correct uh, the missing self interaction in the uh, DFT uh, to correct that missing part. And actually, uh, even let me show our result. I don't think, and you see the effect is really appreciable, and you go to the correct places uh, with the electron structure and the magnetic properties. I haven't uh, showed the, uh, this magnetic moment uh, and so on, uh, but with this U correction, uh, actually you get the correct magnetic space. Then with that, then you can go look at the synchronics or, the, or any application. Uh, you need to get a uh, correct uh, description. Okay. Another question. I hope this is a bit informal since, uh, I mean, I'll try to cover the basics and the idea. Uh, maybe I can write the email. Let me take my time. Let me write my email address here. Uh, so if you have questions, you can send me an email later on as well, okay? It's simple, it's my 
surname, last name, Wilson and Er, then Fan, that Bilken, that edu, that pr. You can always send me a message, ask your questions, ask your, ask my help, uh, and so on. Uh, either the PDFT calculations or these 2D systems, magnetism. I haven't thought that. This is the starting point. Actually, the magnetism needs beyond this. So on top of that, uh, the uh, after getting the correct magnetic state, what we did, uh, we write the uh, uh, magnetic Hamiltonian determined the uh, uh, coupling parameters, exchange parameters J. Then with that, uh, perform the Monte Carlo calculation to get the transition temperature, crude temperature, and so on and so So you need to go beyond this to get the full uh, description of the uh, phase transition and so on. Here, with the, this part, you need this part in order to get this uh, correct magnetic state and its exchange parameters. More questions, please. If you could not ask or cannot ask question uh, for some reason in real time, as Oz Hocam said, you can email to him your questions and I am sure that he will give you the, a comprehensive answer satisfying you. So if there are no more questions, also Jam, maybe we can stop here. What do you think? Yes, definitely. As I said, they can always reach me. I'm available. Okay, don't be frustrated. I will always return back to your uh, messages. So thank you once again for this excellent talk and thank you everybody for coming.